please turn your ads off. Get your junior to mop up, you know, sweep up the hair off the floor and please make sure you answer the phone. For every $100 I put in, if I know that I'm going to get $5,000 back, that's a pretty nice sum. Are you ready for me to rip the Band-Aid off? Are paid ads really worth it? Like we're all posting on social media, learning how to film TikToks, sending the occasional email to our database maybe, but should we be investing a little bit more time and money into Google and Google ads? I mean, people still Google things, right? And if you have a website, and you should, you want to be generating traffic. That's just eyeballs to your website so people can book an appointment. That's ultimately the goal of a website. But figuring out another marketing strategy can just seem a little bit too complicated or a little bit too time consuming, which is why I have brought Google Ads expert Belinda here on the Salon Owners Collective podcast to break it down and really if paid ads are really worth it for you and your salon. When I had my salon, we were always number one in Google. It was a massive part of our success. But really quick, before we start, I wanted to let you know that this episode is brought to you by the Salon Mastery Boardroom. Now, the boardroom is for salon owners who are making a million dollars plus and are ready to grow their business without working more hours, stepping out of daily operations, truly stepping into their role as a salon CEO. Okay, let's jump into the episode. Does your salon actually need paid ads? Enjoy. Belinda, thank you so much for joining me on the Salon Owners Collective Podcast. Nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. For those that don't know who you are, Belinda, who are you? Where are you in the world? What do you do? What is your business? Gosh, so many questions. So <laughs> forgive me if I forget all of them. It won't be. All right. So my name is Belinda and I currently sit in Clayfield in Brisbane in Queensland. Um, but fun fact, I've lived in four countries over the last 15 years. So two and a bit, maybe nearly three years ago, we landed back in Brisbane. Um, third thing, what do I do? I sit in this lovely office that you can see behind me, um, managing Google ads on behalf of other businesses. So I treat their money like my own and I live and breathe Google ads all day, every day. I love that. How did you become a Google Ads expert, like what is the career path that took you to this present day? Gosh, that career path is very interesting. In that I actually have a business degree in health information management out of the health faculty. I had a 15-year career um, in various roles in health um, that included being an analyst for a health fund uh, around the funding models and all sorts of geeky bits and pieces that went along with that. I then became a trailing spouse in uh, in that we moved to another state initially and then to a variety, a couple of different countries, believe it or not, which meant that I didn't work for a short period of time and then that morphed into an entirely new career, starting out with the fact that I did a blog and I couldn't afford to pay anyone to do my SEO. So I learned it for myself and fast forward a decade and I used to be a boutique uh, uh, marketing agency that used to do a bit of everything because my suit, strong suit apart from SEO was the project management side of things and then slowly over time uh, look social media was like a marathon that I was not willing to run anymore there was you know kind of once I wore the thing out I and and or it gave me a reason to want to stop I um, things you know peeled away and where I landed was to do it, uh, doing Google Ads for people because unlike SEO, like my big thing was a decision between SEO and Google Ads and a colleague said to me, why don't you swap teams? Uh, because the th challenge with SEO, and it's gotten even worse in the last 12 months, is that you can put 10 hours in and not guarantee an outcome and you're also competing against people who are willing to break the rules. So that can be very stressful and you've got... No guarantee with Google Ads, but if you put A, B and C in, then you can reasonably expect to get, you know, D, E and F out. Um, I and love I've, that. And I've never looked back. Okay, I love that. So um, when we're thinking about paid advertising, what would you say is the biggest mistake that salon owners make when it comes to doing or thinking about paid marketing? 
two things. Um, one is that business owners full stop very rarely. I've got a calculator that I go through that asks business owners certain metrics about their business. And by metric, I mean things like uh, conversion rate. So I say to salon owners, for every 10 phone calls that you get, how many do you convert? And the amount of I'm like, oh, I don't really know. I'm not sure. Um, interestingly, I had one guy say to me, well, when I answer the phone, it's 90%. But when my junior answers the phone, it's 50%. And I said to him, well, get your junior to mop up, you know, sweep up the hair off the floor and please make sure you answer the phone because there's no point me sending a pile of traffic through if we're going to have 30 to 40% less results because of the person answering the phone. So that's the first one. The second one is a concept they can be forgiven for not knowing and that is lifetime value because Google Ads is never going to be viable. Most advertising is not going to be viable based on one haircut. And as a, as a hairdressing client, I'm a prime candidate for everyone that I work for, which is great, I understand. I do know that you're probably going to offend a couple of people or they're not going to be your jam and they're going to leave after one haircut. And I also know you're going to get what I call lifers who might stay for a decade. And somewhere in the middle is your average or your median. And I know through doing this maths with other salons that that's, depending on whether you're doing colour or not, that sits in the zone of five to $6,000. And all of a sudden, and if I'm telling you it's going to cost $120 to $150 to land a new client, like I had one guy, again, same same dude, who was like, oh, oh that's so much money. I'm not going to pay that money. And I'm like, mate, you're making between three and five grand off people you're good now and he's like oh okay like so to get that concept first of all and then start working towards actually having an answer and I say to people if you've owned your salon for a number of years then what we do is we take your total turnover for however many years you've got and we divide it by the number of people not the number of appointments and that will give you your average and then the final one is the profit margin of the business. And I am absolutely astounded at the amount of businesses who cannot tell me what their profit is. And I don't know why you're in, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love to help people. I'm in business for more than just the money. Um, but honestly, if you can't tell me how much money you're making, then you need to go and have a good look at the figures. Yeah, okay. I love that. And I love that uh, you're making data just, helping owners make data-driven decisions and understand you need to put so much in to get so much back. Like there's a pretty simple math formula. For every $100 I put in, if I know that I'm going to get $5,000 back, that's a pretty nice sum, actually. Do you know? Like that's yeah. a good return on investment. I don't think the math would be quite that good. But um, yeah, that sort of probably leads me to my second uh, thing that I think get that business owners generally get wrong and or can I say that I actually think a lot of the responsibility sits on the shoulders of other consultants and agencies um, again quite blown away by the amount of agencies or consultants that don't talk about viability of ads ads in any format Facebook Google any paid ads they're not suitable for every business I don't run paid Google ads for my own business because it would be exceptionally expensive and I have other excuse me, more cost-effective ways of doing it. So I say to business owners, if your current consultant or agency did not discuss viability of ads with you like at any point and if they're not having conversations with you about ROI and average lifetime value and those sorts of conversations and words and definitions aren't being brought up, then for me that's a pretty large red flag. Mm, for sure. Um, because what you're saying between the lines there is that paid digital marketing or advertising is not necessarily suitable for everybody. A hundred percent correct. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I and I've got a couple of sort of favorite quotes that I that are mine. And one is that you don't want to be a charity to Google. And if you're giving away, and I give the example where I had a lady come to me, and I've only made this mistake once. She came to me, she had an account and I made an assumption because she had an account that that meant that she should be doing ads. So I looked at and it, look, it was a mess. We found so much stuff that could have been improved. And so she went away and I got off the phone and I think, hang on a minute, if you're selling little bottles of wine and the average sale is worth $80 and the average cost per sale 
based on all the conversion percentages, is $20. And you've told me that your profit is 25%. $20 is 25% of 80 bucks. And so I actually rang her immediately and I said to her, have I got this right? And she's like, yep. I said, please turn your ads off. You are never going to make money out of this. You are, and, and look, there are some other little business ideas. You know, if you know that word of mouth is a thing for your business and you just get starting out and you have that experience that you want, you're happy to make no money on the first one because you know that Sally's going to tell five people, then that can be a reason to do ads. But generally speaking, I would want your ads to stand alone and make money. There is no point that you hand away, you know, you can hand away half your profit. You can you can hand away as much as you choose to hand away. But personally, I wouldn't be doing it for no money, you know. You've got to... Yes, understanding the return that you're getting, how much you're putting in and what you're actually getting back. Yeah. And yeah. then I would also say measurable results, like how can you measure the traffic? The great thing I love about digital marketing is you can track the traffic. Yeah, you? 100%. Like you and actually, it's a, there's a real result at the end. It's not just guesswork. Yeah, and, and that's my biggest thing. So I, I like not every salon owner has the budget to be able to spend, you know, $1,000 on ads plus my fee, you know, and you're looking at a minimum of $2,000 a month. Um, I say to people, if you do nothing else that is paid, please get your conversion tracking set up. And by that, I do not just mean Google Analytics. I mean key event events and key events in Google Analytics so that we can measure how many people made an online booking, how many people filled out a contact form. Um, phone calls are a bit more challenging to measure. Um, I say to people, you know, clients complain every now and again, oh, you can't, you can't measure this and you can't measure that. And I say, yeah, but a decade ago we couldn't measure anything. So conversion tracking is not perfect, but it's come a long way. And the other thing I'd say to salon owners is I understand most use a third-party platform um, to make their, their separate bookings. There are platforms and then there are platforms and some are better than others in terms of uh, ability to measure conversions because we need the platform to play nicely with their website. And, and when you're talking about platform, you're talking about online booking, which would yeah. be, you know, booking software. Kutumba, yeah, booking, timely. booking software and some of them, some of them are painful and some of them are far better at integrating with websites and Google Analytics. But if we get it right, then we, the reason I say do it right from the beginning is then you can be measuring your journey. Like there's no point just seeing website traffic and what countries people are coming from or what pages they're going to if we don't do that final step. But a lot of business owners don't know that Google Analytics has that functionality. And I've never, ever in my entire decade long career met a developer who by choice set that up for people they'll frequently set up google analytics but they won't set up the because it's more complicated they won't set up their conversion tracking and then the business owner doesn't know to know that and you get 12 months down the track and say i might do ads for people they're like oh but I'm seeing all these conversions in Google ads and we know we get 10 appointments and that's really great, but how many am I getting from social and how many am I getting organically? And so when we set up conversion tracking, we do across both platforms comprehensively everything you could ever think you'd want to measure so that even if you don't know you need that now, in six to 12 months when you come back to me and say, hey, like what, what am I getting from socials? Do I know that? I can go, yeah, remember when I saved you from yourself? Um, here's the information and here's how you find it. Okay, good. I feel like we're better equipped already in some questions that we have when we're thinking about, you know, the marketing that we're doing and being able to measure its success. Uh, conversion tracking being number one, lifetime value being number two, um, and whether or not it's even a viable option was the third one. Yeah, and look, the viability... Um, I could make a bold statement here and say that it's mostly going to be viable for hairdressing salons because I have experience in that area and my gut tells me that it is. But I'll give you an example of mowing. Um, it's interesting that they say to niche, it turns out I've niched into things that grow and regularly need to be cut and hair and grass are not unlike each other. <laughs> <laughs> True that. <laughs> um, so one of my biggest clients who spends over $10,000 a month on avatar on, on paid ads, um, he wants to dominate 
the entire area that he's in um, and, you know, I know what his cost per click is, but I've had other companies come to me from other states and the price in their state is, or their area is very, very different to my other clients. So we can't make bold statements to say that, I mean, I could, but I'd probably get caught out. Hey, me here again. I just wanted to interrupt this episode real quick. Thank you again for joining me here on the podcast. I just have one quick question for you. Do you ever feel like you're stuck in a two-way cycle? Like two steps forward, two steps back, two steps forward, two steps back. And no matter what you do to grow your salon, there is always a roadblock getting in your way. Like there is a growth ceiling. I can't get past this point. It's time to develop your leadership team so you and your business can grow without you being the roadblock right? Without you working more hours or you being stuck in daily operations. It's time to have some fun and to make more money along the way. So I've got some strategies I'd love to share with you that I know will help. And I want to invite you to join me on a complimentary strategy call. We'll discuss your business, your role inside the business. Tell me about your team. Let's see how I can help you grow the team, grow the business, build a manager, a leadership team, so your business can reach the million dollar mark. All you need to do is click the apply now button in the show notes of this episode. It'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions. It'll take you to my calendar and you're welcome to book a call. All right, that's enough from me. Let's get back to the episode. So I say to everybody, it takes me no time at all to ask the questions, get the answers and your audience now knows the questions I'm going to ask come to me with that information. I will very happily look up your area and give you a bit of a guide. But I have one big fat caveat at the bottom of it that says this is a guide only. This is not a promise. I state that till the cows come home when I'm going through this with people because Google often understates what they tell us in the keyword planner and business owners often get those figures a bit wrong. So we have had some good success with um, some salon owners and I know you've got some good success stories because we want to know that it's possible. Um, give us an example of, you know, how it can work really positively. So my mower guy, I'll give you him because I know his figures off the top of my head um, because, yeah, and he, and look, I've got to say the other thing is there's nothing better than a motivated, invested, interested um, business owner and that's why he's such a dream to work with. Because if I say I need a location page, I did this to him. I said, I, I, I need these location pages because it was a bit different to the way his pages had been set up for SEO on his website. I'm like, that's not really going to work for Google Ads. Can I have A, B and C, please? He's like, yep. A week later, I had the URL. So I say to business owners, I don't expect you to work two hours a day on your Google Ads. But if you think you can throw me money and then ignore me for the, for the, the rest of time, then um, that's not going to work. It's a two-way street. Yeah, that, uh, your, I say to people, your ads are only going to be as good as your participation. I don't need you. you some months you'll hear very little from me. Other months I'll ring you three times in a week um, based on, you know, the needs. But so my, so my, this is probably bigger than some hairdressing salons, although I'm very happy to talk to big ones because I know you, the max. And you, you have a beauty salon that you've had success with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just I don't know those figures off the top of my head. So oh, that's okay. I'll, yeah, so I, I can probably bring that up on one of my other screens and reference it. But just to give you the example of my mower guy, because the lifetime value is not unlike some hairdressers. Um, it's just that he spent more on ads than most hairdressers probably would. Um, we spent $29,000 on ads in four months. And in those four months, over the lifetime, it's going to take two and a half years for him to get this money in the front door because he charges for mowing every month. His average lifetime value was $2,800. We will turn over for him nearly a million dollars and he will profit $250,000 off $29,000 ad spend, at which point I told him when my birthday was and reminded him. He <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Can you speak a little bit to um, the kind of campaign that you might do? Like are these offer campaigns, package campaigns, or just visibility campaigns mm, or something else? Not any, not any of the above. To, uh, a little bit of some of what you said. Um, generally speaking, we, uh, we 
you would understand that search terms um, or keywords, there's really specific ones and there's really broad ones right at the top. Um, I do not include things like um, short hairstyles for women because they are people looking for a Pinterest picture um, to change their hair up because, you know, they've had a bad week and have decided it's time for change or whatever the thing is. Um, we go chasing the very specific keywords like hairdresser near me, um, hair salon near me, particularly like salons that do colour because it's worth more money. Um, and in saying that, profile the heck out of things and in some cases remove the word haircut because it's I'm making an assumption that people like my husband are going to search for haircut and they're looking for a 20-buck job in five minutes just down the road. So we have to make some assumptions based on the ad spend that the person has to spend, the distance we think people will travel. For example, I think if you're a blonde specialist, people are more likely to want to travel or be prepared to travel a bit further to get to you, whereas if you're doing standard, you know, haircuts and blow dries, then probably that distance is a bit less. So we split them apart and put them into their own campaigns so that we can deal with them very separately. But to answer your question, I do search ads, which are the, the text at the top of any Google search um, for most of the clients, and they're focused very, very specifically on those con terms that we know convert. The ad copy then has to represent what it is they do and match very closely to those keywords so that so that they resonate with the audience. And then the, what my goal, I will have done my job if someone then clicks on the ad. And what we call that is the click-through rate. Um, if you can get that, you know, they kind of talk about some very global benchmarks, which is more than 3%. I aim for more than five. Um, it's very common to get between five and 10, sometimes even more. I was just looking at an account this morning that was, um, I think it was 15% click-through rate. So that means for every... 100 people that see the ad, 15 are clicking on it. Um, that's if That measures if I've done my job. What a lot of business owners look at is the number of conversions I get. Um, I don't actually get any conversions. The salon and the website get conversions. And that's a, it's a really important point to make because if things aren't going well, and sometimes they don't for whatever reason, um, they'll be like, but there's no conversions. I'm like, well... I can, I can continue to work on the account, but it's why I'm very, very careful not to take on accounts that have well, let's, websites. Well, let's talk about that because actually what your job is to send traffic, people clicking and eyeballs, people clicking to the website. But if they get to the website and the website's not doing its job, it's not functional, it's not um, beautiful, it's not easy to use, you can't click on something to make an appointment or find the information that you want, then you're doing all of that work basically for nothing. And so matching the key word search and what they're clicking through needs to match what they're arriving to so they're getting the thing that they think they're moving to. Yeah, that's um, it. And so if you're selling yourself as Brisbane's best blonde hair, you know, um, hair specialist, hair colorist, and I get to your website and it looks like, you know, my 12-year-old nephew built your website and it's full of low-quality stock images and poorly worded and poor, poor functionality and it, 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 no one's going to convert. If you're offering a five-star service, dare I say it with a five-star price because I'm very aware of what hairdressing, you know, particularly the colour services are worth, then your website needs to look the way that just like you look the like how you're going to represent, you've got beautiful hair most days, you know, all of that, the website needs to look the same. The style and the quality needs to represent the service or the product that you're actually. And, and, and in saying that, I specifically have a task in my SOPs that says be a mystery. I mean, I look in a discovery call, I look at their website and I, I say to people, I'm never rude, but are you ready to, for me to rip the Band-Aid off? Because I'm going to have to provide you feedback about your website and unless you change these things, um, then the, we yeah. can't work together. Yes, okay, that's really great. And I think that's really important that we understand that because one, your website needs to look beautiful, but it actually needs to also function beautiful. And not my experience is that not all web developers understand the both. Like they don't understand conversion metrics or like uh I'm going to call it clicking behavior for lack of a better quality word. And they might either understand that and not design or they understand design and they don't understand conversion. 
Um, and so it's, in my experience, reasonably hard to find someone who understands both. Yeah, so look, I, having been an agency before, what I used to do is I, I used to work with both and it probably cost me money, but look, I charged an appropriate amount for my websites in that I had a graphic designer who would lay the website out and then I would have a website developer who would build it. I, I totally agree with you. I have never come across a website developer who had good taste and I've never come across a graphic designer that has the technical skills to build a good website. So, um, yeah, both of those things are, are very, very true. When I get a client in more detail, I actually pretend to be a customer. And like this one from about four years ago, I'm still waiting for the reply. Like if if you're not going to reply, like, and, and I had a photographer once, and this is how it came about. She said to me, oh, my, I'm not getting the conversions and something's dropped off all of a sudden. And I was like, right, well, let's step through the process of how to become. And her website was beautiful and her photography is amazing and that's why I took her on. And then I went through the process and because she was so focused on the photography but didn't have the technical skills, she was sending a PDF in landscape and a PDF in portrait, depending on whether you were on a desktop or a mobile. Like I'm confused even trying to describe to you what she was doing. The poor audience would have just, and, and it was a physical download and it was just a mess. And so I worked through with her and said, look, I'm not the website developer and I'm not even being paid to do this bit, but let's get this sorted out and make this a website page link that you send people to to see extra stuff because you're confusing the heck out of your audience and it's no wonder that you're not getting the conversion. If you conf- if you confuse, you lose. There's, there's no two ways about that in terms of actually anything. But if you confuse your customer, you lose them straight away and you lose their attention and that's ultimately what we're competing for now. Is yeah, you have, sec- you have seconds to get it right and if, yours, and if your platform's not loading quickly, if it's not functioning quickly, if you ask for too much information and the big one, and I know like some businesses have no choice, but... On a form, I don't care less how many fields you have on your form, but make it, mine's, mine's designed to be a test. My discovery call has about 18 questions, but only three are mandatory. <laughs> and these days I can say not because I'm being painful, but if someone doesn't fill it out, I send it back to them and say, can you, in the nicest way possible, please fill out the form. It will help me work well with you, da-da-da. But that's a different story. Um you just got to make it as streamlined as possible. And the younger the audience, the, the more allergic they're going to be to you ringing them or wanting to hand their mobile number over. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, being a business owner yourself, what would you say is a mantra, a quote, or something that keeps you kind of focused on the short and narrow uh, every day in business? Literally just keep going. Oh, yeah. That's it. Love that. Because the ones of us who are around after a decade just kept going. Um, and the other one I thought of when I when I saw that question was, um, and look, it's, there's lots going on this year. It's totally okay to have a big cry, get it done in five minutes, and then just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very appropriate, that one. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, what is a, a podcast, a, a website, a book, or something that you've, uh, you know, got involved in recently that you think all salon owners should get their hands on? Well, I saw on. that question and I was like, I'm so naughty. I have a paid Google Ads group, so I'd recommend um, the likes of yourselves, like find the experts in your industry and stalk them till the cows come home. Um, I have a paid group for Google Ads and it has, I don't even know how many of us are in there. Um, I just know there's not many girls. <laughs> um, and for me, that's what I, I, that's all I do. I literally don't. I don't listen to many podcasts. I don't read as many books as I should. I break every rule in the book, but I would find the experts in your industry and then follow the people they follow. And without like giving myself a big plug, the specific individuals related to specific topics. So I tend not to follow agencies that do all the things. I follow the specific people who, you know, just do Facebook ads or just do Google ads or just do SEO because I feel like these days that um, unless you're an agency with lots of staff, if someone says to you that they can do it all, um, they're either lying and they have a team or they're going to do a really terrible job because I just don't think you can be an expert at all things because of how sophisticated the industry is now. Yeah, yeah, I think well said. 
Um, all right, where can people find you, stalk you, and learn more about you, Belinda? You can find me on Instagram. I'm under my name there, so it's belinda.irvine, um, and I wore my little T-shirt, my one and only uniform today. Um, so my website you can go to is all the W's, bell.digital. It's not a nice. standard URL, so yeah, bell.digital. Love that. Appreciate your time today and sharing your insights. It's been great. Thank you for having me. And that's a wrap. Thanks, Belinda. And I know I've said this before, but the numbers will always tell you what to do next in your business, which is why I totally agree with Belinda that if you don't have the time or money to do Google Ads right now, make sure you have your conversion tracking ready to go. That will give you the insight that you need to see if your website is actually converting and actually getting clients from there, or do you just have your head in the sand? It'll also make your job way easier when you're in a position to dedicate some time to setting up Google Ads, maybe after you become a Salon CEO. Then it's time to join the Salon Mastery boardroom. So I hope this episode has given you some clarity around paid ads and feel confident either way on what your next step is. Thank you again, Belinda, for joining me on the Salon Owners Collective podcast. And if you're looking to grow to the million dollar mark and beyond, I have some space for you inside the Salon Mastery boardroom. All you need to do is click apply now in the show notes. Let's hop on a call. Meanwhile, have a great week. Till next week. Ciao for now.